Um, I'm Rebecca Grazer. I'm with Army Corps of Engineers. I'm acting as our section chief for the north and western portion of the state, which covers our Hayward and Stevens Point offices. But my standard position is acting as the program manager for the state of Wisconsin. And as such, I can speak to some of our national initiatives, but really my focus is always going to be on Wisconsin here. Um, I think this slide speaks for itself. Normally I speak in person so I can ask questions from you and make sure that everyone's on their toes. I know we've got a lot of time today and really how much of this three hour block we have is going to be dictated by your interest. Um, since I can't see everyone, please do tell me if I need to slow down or speak up. Um, as Christina indicated earlier, I do welcome interruptions, particularly if they enhance learning. Please do let me know. Um, in addition to that, I do use a lot of acronyms. I've been with the Corps long enough. I'm rather institutionalized. So I do try to call those out in my presentation as I go, but certainly if I haven't or you need to hear it again because there's so many of them, please let me know and I can um, be sure to stop and, and clarify anything. Okay, so really I have three very broad topics I'd like to talk today about with you. Um, I'll try to throw in a little humor where I can just so that everyone doesn't fall asleep. The first one is really how we have the authority to look at the projects that people are doing on their property. Um, the second is what type of review applies to a given project. And the third really gets at how we evaluate a proposed project. So. With that, I'm going to try to focus on some of the examples that would be more germane to the work that you do, but certainly if you have any questions beyond that, we can address those as well. Um, one of the things that I'll also do, and I think I saw Cami Peterson popped in here, but so she's welcome to chat as possible as um, she feels free, but a couple of places throughout this presentation today, I'm going to compare and contrast what I see as a difference between the way we operate and the way the state might. And with the hope that um, at the end of this presentation, you'll understand why we do the things we do and why we might seem bizarre in our processes, um, you know, and, and generally that we aren't crazy and making stuff up on the fly. Um, and I'll try to periodically check, like I say, to make sure there aren't any questions. I like to throw this slide in somewhere in my presentations. Um, depending on how big a screen you have, you might be able to read this. This actually came into our office in 1981. I'm not going to tell you what I was doing at the time this came in, but um, I put it in here to lighten the mood. Um, I'm not sure about the audience here, but having just been Halloween, maybe most of you have seen the, the movie Ghostbusters and they've got that guy from EPA in there and he has no humor at all. Um, so I like to put this in because I don't want to be that guy. Um, I'm not making fun of it either in case there's a question here. I think it's a really neat artifact, maybe one of the most remarkable requests we ever had. So I like to share and of course I blocked out any personal information there. Um, but feel free to type in a good joke about it. I'm a bad joke teller and this could help snap us back when we need some something interesting and the discussion on regulations gets tiring. Um, and, and just for a spoiler alert, we did not require a permit for this boy's proposal to be shackled and thrown into Lake Michigan and Sheboygan. Okay, now the fun stuff. We actually do have two regulatory authorities that we use in Wisconsin. Um, the lesser known one is Section 10 of the Rivers and Harbors Act. And as you can see, that's a really old piece of legislation. Um, and Section 404 is what I think most people here are familiar with. And that's really the meat and potatoes of our program. I threw a couple pictures in here for you to just illustrate a little bit of um, this is more what you would see as a Section 10 activity. And while this could be considered a Section 10 water, I'll get into that in a minute, what you see here is an activity that would also require um, permitting under Section 404. Can everyone see my cursor on the screen? <laughs> 
I can oh. see it a little bit, yeah. Okay. Well, maybe I'll, let me see here. I know I was told that there are some really fancy tools I can use here. There we go. This is the area I was talking about that would be fill. Now let me see if I can get rid of that. Okay. So just to get into a little bit of Section 10 of the Rivers and Harbors Act of 1899, what it really is, to boil it down to a nutshell, is regulating pretty much anything that could happen within a federally navigable water. And here's my first compare and contrast with the Department of Natural Resources, because what our two agencies define as navigable is dramatically different. Um, the waters that we determined federally navigable were determined by Congress way, way, way back in time. Actually, not that far back, not as far back as 1899. I think the last waters added to the list were in the 60s. Um, but it's a finite list of waters, and it's the larger waters that nationally were recognized, at least at the time they were listed, as being um, used for or capable to be used for uh, interstate commerce. So all our waters that are Section 10 are listed on our website. So if you're ever interested, um, some examples of those would be in the Milwaukee area, the downstream portions of the Kinnikinnick, the Milwaukee, um, the Rock, the Fox River in the northeastern part of the state, the Nemagi in the northwest part of the state, the Wisconsin River in the um, that would be the southwest part of the state. Uh, so there are more waters than that, but that gives you a flavor of what we're looking at for those. Um, and as you're probably aware, the state definition of what a navigable water is is a little bit more inclusive. Um, checking my questions. Oh, and there's the authority for it. I, I knew you were all waiting for that. Here's a couple things where we can show some Section 10 activities just to be illustrative. Um, let me get my big red dot here. Over on this first picture here on the left, you can see that there's some work that's below the plane of the ordinary high water mark uh, that we, we would be regulating. I can be fairly certain that this bank stabilization has crept up probably to the silt fence here. Um, now certainly portions of this are clearly in dry land, so we wouldn't have authority over that, but the limits of the Section 10 will come up and include the wetlands that are directly abutting the waterway. One thing to note is this bridge back here, I've been asked, I've used this slide before, this bridge is something that we would not regulate under Section 10 because that's a strange caveat. While Section 10 is generally largely inclusive of anything that can happen, the authority to review bridges in these waterways is delegated to the Coast Guard. Now with that said, um, if there were a deposition of fill material, then we would still retain Section 404 authority. So I'm sure that's clear as mud. Um, but um, so two authorities, only one would apply in this case to the, to the bridge construction. Um, for this project here, I've been asked if the placement of the boats themselves would be something that we would regulate. And while I shouldn't laugh because there are a lot of silly things when you have to legislate something that's intended to be a regulatory program, um, it gets wonky. But um, in this case, no, it makes sense. We aren't regulating the boats that are docked here. But Provided this area is a Section 10 waterway, the installation of this pier would be within our authority. So the upshot of Section 10 is that under this authority, there are fewer resources that we regulate, but more actions within them fall under the authority. Um, even to the, and, and to get to some of these things being a little bizarre, um, a good example would be that uh, um, a utility line that's slung overhead a Section 10 water even would require authorization from our agency. So that's, that's one that 
um, in practice is a little interesting, but um, if you get into it a little, the, the causation behind that is because um, of commerce in that case. So we, the primary factor that we would look at is ensuring that it doesn't hinder that. And with that, that's all I had on section 10. So we'll get into a little bit more of the meat and potatoes. Oh, let me get rid of that circle of our authority here. Um, and this is a slide I use very often, too, because I think it's very true nationally, especially. Um, one thing I will say is I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the clean water rule that was proposed jointly by the Environmental Protection Agency and our agency. It actually briefly went into effect in Wisconsin beginning on April 28th and then was subsequently stayed nationally um, by, I think, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals in October. So we're back to doing business the way we, we did prior to that rule. Um, but certainly that has increased the controversy and the focus on our program nationally. Um, I do want to just mention these last two points over here, the decisions, best professional judgment, and balancing environmental protection. Um, they're primary drivers, in my opinion, for why we're controversial. Uh, I suspect many of you might agree. And we'll get into a little bit of how that plays in and how we can try to use that best professional judgment and that balancing in an equitable fashion where we're making consistent decisions later on in this presentation. So there, the next slide here is a little bit about what the Act itself does. Here's a good picture. I should use it more often in my daily life. Um, I'll let you read the text for most of these slides and I'll just talk a little bit about them. And the Act is, of course, the legislative um, mechanism that provides our agency the authority and our regulations, guidance documents, and the courts dictate how we actually accomplish it, um, unless the legislature, of course, wants to be more prescriptive. So based on the information we have in the Act, one of the first tasks of the executive branch was to define a few key terms. And if you take a look at this here, some of them are kind of um, ambiguously written, even though they might at first blush seem clear. Um, the first being what is fill material, and of course, more recently, at the heart of controversy, what is the water of the United States. Um, one thing I will say about the proposed clean water rule is that, unfortunately, I'm not in a position to talk much about it if anyone has any questions. Um, if some of you remember the interpretive rule we had a little bit of, um, what would that have been? two years to a year ago. Um, certainly you're welcome to put any questions about that in the chat and I'll try to get to those as I can. But some of these, because of their contention and particularly the clean water rule because of the um, litigation that's ongoing, there's going to be a limited ability for me to speak to it. Um, of course, what's happening on a national scale is way above my pay grade. But I can talk more about how we do business now, which has been the interim guidance that we've had for the last seven years. So getting back to some of the definitions here, let's talk about first what is fill material. And it looks like this is one of the more prescriptive definitions here, but unfortunately it still leaves quite a bit to be desired. Um, perhaps one of the biggest hurdles faced working with our agency that as our program becomes more prescriptive, definitions that should seem obvious become tacitly defined and pretty inflexible. Some would say to the point of being less helpful or clear. This is directly from our existing regulations and as prescriptive as it is, like I say, it still in some cases is not clear enough for regulatory purposes. Um, a couple things would be this definition here doesn't speak to the duration of material. Now, certainly from a common sense perspective, um, if something just falls for a moment and is picked up again, for example, if someone is shoveling and um, with a hand spade, would we be looking at that? If, if they make a small pile there for a couple hours, probably not. Um, but 
if they were to make a big pile with a hand spade and leave it there for a few months, I think that would make it a lot easier. There is some gray area in interpretation that isn't addressed. Um, so I guess since this is, I think this is often a question about what fill is, I'm going to try to look to the chat here and see if there's any questions that anyone has about how we defined fill. Um, for example, about a discharge, uh, dirt falling off the bucket of an excavator, or installation of drain tile through a wetland, or boardwalks. These are all things that I think might be more of interest to the people we have on here. Um, what I can say about drain tile through a wetland, um, unfortunately, a lot of that comes down to the method of construction. So as you work with our agency, you're going to see that. And as we learn more about construction techniques, what you may have relied upon is a pretty clear definition for how to construct may change. So I would always recommend that people come to the, the project manager that they've got for the county and talk to them about a proposed project. Um, and again, here's one where Cammie might be perking up her ears because um, for the state, um, I think their authority for, their general authority is for work in wetlands, so it's a little bit different. Um, they also have an added layer on the onion where they're delegated Section 401 of the Clean Water Act as well. So they provide water quality for our 404 permits. And I'm not sure if that's really ever clear that the state kind of when they issue a permit for a wetland project, they're really doing it under those two authorities at the same time. Um, and, and just a little sidebar to that, I think one of the biggest... I don't want to say complaints because it sounds really negative, but one of the biggest issues that I hear from the public about the regulatory authority that we have is that all three means of regulating, or two if you're just viewing the state program as one permit to obtain, it seems similar and duplicative to a lot of people in the public, but what I think a lot of the public doesn't understand is that there's a different purpose and intent to each law that's lost in translation for those not working with the regulations themselves. So roughly speaking, um, Section 404 authority that's implemented by the Corps again is a loss of waters associated with fill activities where the state's 401 Clean Water Act looks more at water quality impacts. And I think if I'm going to to try to interpret the state law, which is really, really dangerous, especially being recorded, so take it for what it's worth. But my two cents on that is that the state law first was promulgated to cover resources and activities that could impair wetlands that weren't otherwise covered by the Clean Water Act. Um, and historically, my understanding is that state law was specific to waters not covered under the Clean Water Act or the jurisdiction of the court in Wisconsin, but it became very challenging for some of the water management specialists um, statewide to know which wetlands that would apply to without having to wait for the core, and, and that's my understanding of why the state law was changed. So my fun fact that on that, and I'll look for a chat from Cammie if she'd like to correct me. All right, so moving on again, 404, whoa, sorry about that, spoiler, oh, oh. there we go. Section 404 activities, um, I throw a couple in here, you'll notice, let me get my red dot, this one is on here again because um, Section 404 is a little different than Section 10. Section 404 applies to a very broad base of aquatic resources with a narrow focus on activities relegated only to fill. So um, in this case, even a federally navigable water under Section 10 would be also um, reviewed under Section 404 of the Clean Water Act if there is a discharge of fill proposed with the activity. So. If it's a federally navigable water and there's fill, your permit from the Corps will address both Section 10 and 404. This one, I think, um, is a little bit more, I'd like to say obvious, but it's a little interesting because if you really look at it, um, I'm not ultimately sure what they're doing, but it very much looks like the, the final grade that they're trying to achieve is lower. 
So that can be often contentious. Um, I think depending on the regulator you talk to, again, these piles, let me get my red dot, these piles here would be something that they would want, they would feel more comfortable hanging their hat on. But as many of you may know, most grading activities where you're um, equalizing a surface area incorporate a discharge of fill. Um, at least that's how we look at it here in Wisconsin. This final slide on the right I wanted to include because this is one that was very near and dear to my heart right here. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the pin pile. This actually resulted in a discussion that went all the way up to our chief because the question was, does this little footing here um, incorporate a discharge of fill that we would regulate? Um, I almost feel like I should leave this up to you guys to vote for it in your chat. But um, it was actually very challenging because there is a location in our regulations where they talk about pilings as fill, and this structure is called a pin pile. What it is here, if you're not familiar, each of these three little knobs that you can see, and there, there are four, um, they're actually just big pins that drive diagonally down into the earth to anchor the boardwalk. Um, looking to see, nobody wanted to vote on this one. Um, the way it did shake out is that this pin pile itself is considered fill for purposes of 404 in Wisconsin. And unfortunately, so you, I'm kind of belying my opinion on this, um, but my opinion doesn't count because we try to be consistent across the state. Disclaimer there, again, um, is that the small little area here, and I want to say this was something like 8 by 8, needed to be added up both sides all the way down within the wetland and cumulatively authorized. So fun fact on that one. Um, all right, so I think that's enough on this one. Moving into that second definition that I mentioned, what is the water of the U.S.? Again, I'm not really able to talk about the clean water rule very much because of the pending legislation on it, but that was the heart of the rule, was to define for the core and for other programs that use that definition within the clean water rule, what is a water of the U.S.? And the reason it was brought forward is because of a few court cases that have occurred in the last, well, the, well really two in the last 15 years that challenged how we were previously defining it. And as a result of both of those court cases, we were given implementing guidance, but it was never formally promulgated into any regulation that we could rely upon. So the clean water rule intent was to remedy that. Um, what I'm going to show you here is inclusive of that interim guidance, largely predicated upon the most recent court case, which was the Rapanos and Carabel cases. Um, another fun fact for you guys, and this is not a joke, but I find it sort of funny. Both of these cases that challenged how we define waters of the U.S. originated in our neighbor's state to the south. So whatever they're doing there, they're very controversial. Um, in a nutshell here, you can see there's really two main bullets. The first one, pick up my red dot for you, is what is colloquially termed the Scalia test. Um, the last Supreme Court case we had resulted in no majority opinion, so that made it a little bit more challenging for us to implement our program. Um, so these really represent the two opinions that comprised the majority, and that's how we were directed to operate as a result of the rule. So this is kind of what I would call the no-brainer list of waterways that should be subject to our jurisdiction under Section 404. And this one is a little bit more tenuous, and we call this the Kennedy, the Kennedy, um, I'm losing my English here, Kennedy test. So uh, this one is really where we come up with that significant nexus determination. Um, 
to evaluate whether the resource should be considered a water of the U.S. I'll get into that once I get rid of my red dot a little more. So again, the resources that aren't on that no-brainer list, again, traditionally navigable waters, associated wetlands, relatively permanent waters and their abutting wetlands, and seasonally permanent waters and abutting wetlands, if we're to pursue an approved jurisdictional determination process, require a significant nexus to evaluate if they're jurisdictional. Typically in Wisconsin, we see that applied to waters that flow less than seasonally or intermittently, and it's applied often to adjacent wetlands that maybe aren't directly abutting. Under our current and Rapanos guidance, most isolated resources remain outside the regulatory jurisdiction of the core, um, and that is one thing that um, I don't want to say necessarily would have changed, but the number of waters that would have been subject to a significant nexus under the rule that's currently stayed would have been reduced. Um, with that said, I don't have a slide in here talking about um, our preliminary jurisdictional process. And what I will say is um, that's the majority of the determinations we do in the state. Anything that doesn't fit that no-brainer approved jurisdictional determination process and falls under a significant nexus is a very laborious process. Um, and, and most applicants would prefer not to go through it. It requires copious pages of research, field visits, coordination with EPA, and elevated review within our district. So um, on average, I would say pursuit of a approved jurisdictional determination for a significant nexus waterway adds two months onto our review time. Um, so if that's what someone is faced with and the likely outcome is that it would be within our jurisdiction, most people opt to pursue a pre uh, preliminary jurisdictional determination process just to get through a little bit quicker. And that's something that we were afforded to do in, I believe, Regal 0802. So, um, a more recent regulatory guidance letter that we have, and those are all available on our headquarters website. So if anyone's interested in that, I can provide that later. All right. So with that, something that hasn't been contentious in a while is what is a wetland? Um, one thing I will stay, say about this one, it's yet another one where there's a mild difference in the way the state evaluates this compared to us, and it's just in the definitions that we've been handed. Theirs is a little different, but I, I'm trying to think of a situation where that small difference has generated um, a different determination between our agencies, and frankly, I can't find one. Um, so, so I don't, don't know if that's worthy of mentioning any more than I just have. Um, and just a little funny fact, a couple of chiefs ago, we would have conferences for our district and when we would get together, the chief would randomly call on the newest person working for our agency and ask them to provide this definition. And he wanted it verbatim, so that was always a good, I'll call it a hazing activity for the core. But it did have the benefit of whomever got called on, they never forgot it after that. So I suppose from a program perspective, that's pretty good. Um, another thing with this definition that isn't really afforded any, any thought in our regulations, and we have come up with ways to operate and define this through um, guidance, is uh, how long should a determination of where the wetland boundaries are be valid. In Wisconsin, we typically look at that as being not more than five years. Um, many people don't hear the not more than part and presume it's five years. And I just want to call that out because I'd like people to be very clear. Um, we, we may truncate that time frame, particularly when there's adjacent development or on-site development, because that really changes as all of you know, the hydrology that may be on site, and that being one of our parameters.
parameters for definition is subject to change, whether that be shrinking the boundary or expanding it. Um, the upshot of how we define a wetland is rather than being a continuum on the ground that shrinks and contracts and expands depending on the season and the year that we're having, um, it is intended to be a bright line so that can, on the positive, give people some some sense of uh, a finite place where they can rely upon for their projects. So with that, those are the main three terms I wanted to define in our program. I'll give you a couple stats just so you can see what we typically look at um, annually. And these are usually uh, pretty solid numbers. I've been asked quite a bit if that changed as a result of the recession in 2008. And honest, honestly, it really didn't drop these numbers any at all. Um, I will call out this is our district-wide, so it is Minnesota and Wisconsin. But roughly speaking, the numbers could simply be just divided in half because it really is pretty equal between the two states. So. Um, a rule of thumb would be about 3,000 regulatory actions annually in Wisconsin. Um, but if you look, only about half of those are permit decisions. So um, some of those activities include our no permit required, our exemption determinations, our unfortunately our enforcement, and activities where we may only review a wetland delineation and there's no subsequent action once that boundary is identified. Take a minute here to see if anyone has any questions on what we're talking about as far as our authorities before I jump into a little bit more here on how we, the, uh, the tools we have to evaluate projects. Okay. All right, I see no one typing, but certainly you're welcome to. Um, just getting into this a little bit, the slide's titled Levels of Review, but I feel it's almost a misnomer title to this section because I want to touch on the process to determine if, it's a, per if a permit is needed and if so, which type. Um, to give you a little comfort, when our staff go through this process to determine if a permit's needed and which type, we always will apply the lowest level of review applicable, even if that means none. Uh, unless there's some unusual circumstance, the resource is particularly important. It doesn't happen very often. If we like to elevate our level of review beyond the lowest possible, we have to complete what's called a discretionary uh, memo documenting our reasons for it, and that goes all the way up to our kernel. Um, I've had one as our program manager in Wisconsin in the last year, and that was for an Enbridge project. So it doesn't happen very often. So here's kind of the first questions our staff need to consider here. and. Um, Running through them quick, if the answer to these three in order is yes, yes, and no, then a permit's required. Obviously, if the subject land is not a jurisdictional resource, we wouldn't require a permit. If there's no regulated activity, even if it's a jurisdictional resource, no permit is required. And obviously, if it is jurisdictional resource, it is a regulated activity, but it meets our exemption, no permit is required. So these are really three things that preface our review before we even get to evaluating something for a permit. Um, one thing I will call out on this slide is I have put exemption on here. These are codified in our regulations, and a lot of people seem to misconstrue these as the same as a non-reporting activity, and they're really not. Exempt means it's not regulated. A non-reporting um, activity is something that's regulated without formal correspondence needed, provided that the applicant or the project proponent can adhere to the conditions that are included with the non-reporting general permit. 
Um, so with that, I've given you a little bit of a lead-in on the exemptions. I want to talk about those a little bit more um, because those are very controversial and I figure probably of some interest to some of our participants here. Um, we have, and if I had candy bars, I'd throw one out to anybody who can tell me how many exemptions we have. We have six. I didn't mean to have all these wonderful, uh-oh, there we go. I didn't mean to have all these uh, uh, little effects in here. I actually took some of these slides from a presentation that we've given called Zen and the Art of Ditch Maintenance. So um, credit to that. It was a wonderful title. Now, here's another location where Candy might perk up because I want to talk about a few things that are a little different in our exemptions from what the state has. Um, I once talked to one of the senators when they were promulgating this and asked him if we could try to be consistent just so it wouldn't create confusion for the general public and the regulated public. And he said, we'll be consistent with you where we want to be. So um, I respectfully took that for what it was worth and moved on. In a nutshell, um, the state's exemptions are missing this word recently right here. Um, and while most people would say big deal, it really does have, it could have the potential to influence how we are evaluating a project for exemption between our agencies. Uh, another, and I should have numbered these instead of bulleting them, but this fourth one here and this fifth one here are exemptions that the state does not have. And this third one here, they break in half roughly where one exemption is construction or maintenance of farmer stock ponds or irrigation ditches, and a separate exemption is maintenance of drainage dishes. Um, and then finally, one thing I do want to call out too, and I think this runs as a common thread running through our programs, is these are for the state wetland exemptions, but for the core, they're broader than that. They're waters of the U.S. exemptions. So for us, we don't bifurcate our regulation dependent on whether the resource is a wetland or a waterway. Both under 404 are rolled into the same thing. So when we evaluate something under one of these exemptions, it could apply not just to a wetland, although that's the majority of the activities, but also to a waterway. Um, and I guess one, one last thing here, and maybe not so germane for your program, but since I'm pointing out some differences, um, their exemption, oops, let's pick up this red spotlight, right here is a little bit different. If I remember, I think theirs is um, temporary mining roads. So I, I think that has some change in how we would view them, although I don't know that that's really been an issue. Point being, that whether intentional or not, these, these mild differences in, in the wording used requires us to dwell over very precise wording, which makes us look a little bit like pencil pushers when we try to consistently adhere. And unfortunately, if we try not to dwell on the details of the language, can end up setting us up for a legal challenge in court. So um, just to bring back that little Ghostbusters, I think that guy's name was Peck. Uh, and then, just in case anyone had a burning question about what Section 208B4 of the Clean Water Act, here's another acronym, sorry, is it is an area-wide waste treatment plan. And I should call out as well here that I have CFR indicated, that's Code of Federal Regulations, that's the acronym I'm using there. I've got a few more, three more, I think, slides on exemptions. Um, next one here is some kickouts. So while we have these six exemptions, they aren't just taken at face value. Um, there's much more language. First of all, there's much more language included for each of those exemptions within our regulations, pages and pages of it. So it gets into a lot of minutia um, that you're welcome to read. It's publicly available. Um, I can send it to you. You can look it up online. Um, 
I'll also let that be a shameless plug for the working sessions Christina mentioned earlier in the next few months because I think we will likely end up getting into a lot more detail in the application of exemptions, perhaps even some case studies. Um, one thing, again, to call out, um, the state has other ways to get at this, but they don't have this applicable to their exemption kickouts. They do have something similar to our recapture provision. Um, I'll let you read that here. But it's a two-part test. And drum roll, the questions for them are, um, yes, no questions there. Uh, I think this is, and Cami can correct me here, but I think that they have this in the state statute around 281.365. Um, but there's some distinctions between them. Often when we're evaluating a project which may be eligible for an exemption, this test describes some of the minimization needed to remain eligible. Um, especially this, the second one here. And some of the difficulty with these is, for example, if someone wants to put a stream impoundment in, that's problematic for the evaluation. Or just deposition of spoil materials and wetlands. I know sometimes when people clear cut, they like to stack that wood somewhere. Um, and there have been, remarkably, times where there have been so much brush that we actually do start looking at whether or not it's in, in, impairing the flow and circulation of the waters. Because certainly we wouldn't say in that case it was intending to convert. Um, another key thing to consider when looking at the exemptions, um, they need to be narrowly construed. So as a rule of thumb, when we have something that may or may not be, and it's really on the bubble, um, this line of thought kicks in, and normally it will be moved into a permit process. And these are kind of, there are more reasons for this, but these are the two that I think are pretty, pretty defensible here, the legislative history and then a court case from 1986. Um, other tools that we use to define that, we've got a few regulatory guidance letters. We call those regals. Um, again, those are available online, but uh, three key ones. One is 0702, which means it was given the second regulatory guidance letter in 2007, and that treats irrigation ditches and ditches. Uh, and then two from the 80s. One is 1987 or 8709, and that treats farm and stock ponds. And the third one that off the top of my head I can think of is 8603, and that treats farm and forest roads. Um, one other thing I'll add in here, too, is that we use a lot of experience and oversight to help us determine whether or not a proposed activity meets our exemptions. It is, it's extremely challenging, frankly. And all draft exemption de de uh, English decisions that we make are reviewed by a secondary senior reviewer right now to ensure that we're consistent in our interpretation. And the reason I mention this is to give you a little comfort that our staff aren't running out and just making these decisions in a vacuum. They really do have to be processed at a, at a moderately high level, but also because I think it hits home the concept that if it's so hard for us who are schooled in the regulations to make these decisions, it's very challenging for a layperson to know. And unfortunately, if someone makes doesn't come to us to get confirmation of an exemption and they move forward with the project because they're fairly confident that they've evaluated it appropriately, if it turns out that they aren't correct, unfortunately, we are not allowed to necessarily consider that and whether or not we might pursue enforcement activity. Um, so 
you know, the upshot is that unfortunately there really isn't a great cookbook um, and things like purpose or recapture are very case specific for us to evaluate. So that's the end of what I had on exemptions. I see no one's got any questions, but certainly you're welcome to type. I'm going to move on a little bit into getting into our permit process here. So again, reflecting on this earlier slide, it was slide 17. Um, if you get to a yes, yes, no out of these three questions, you start moving into the permitting review process. Um, and, and unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your interest level, not only am I going to talk a little bit about the types of permits that are available for activities, but I'm also going to get into our evaluation process a little bit with the hope that if you understand how we have to look at things and why we look at things the way we are, it can minimally help you with things like an application to our agency in the future. And, and maybe also it'll highlight to you how nice it is to have a general permit program. So moving into the permit process, in Wisconsin there's actually four types of general permits we have and their authorities are listed here. The first three are regional general permits and one of my jobs when I'm not acting is to spend quality time drafting these. So if you've got any complaints about them, certainly you're welcome to voice them to me as well. We're always trying to approve them and I know our GP2 Wisconsin is actually slated to expire, um, I want to say summer of 2016, so that one's ripe for reissuance. Um, one thing that has been a rub is in that general permit is that we've got a non-reporting category for bank stabilization, We've got a, non, a separate non-reporting category for habitat restoration projects that are funded for your purposes, I think, in whole or in part by NRCS or by Fish and Wildlife Service. But we have no category that combines the two of those together. So that's something that I'm aware of that's been problematic. Um, we're trying to use a lot of Band-Aid processes to get through our evaluation for projects where you might see um, some bank stabilization work proposed and some lunker structures maybe thrown in. Um, but that's something that we might look at in the near future trying to get something that is one solid category that might holistically take a look at the two of those being coupled together. Um, some more fun facts, I would say depending on the year, 70 to 85 percent, usually it ends up being the higher 85 percent of those regulatory actions that we do annually. Again, um, it would be roughly 1,750 in Wisconsin. About 85 percent of those end up falling within these regional general permits. Very, very infrequently do we use the nationwide in Wisconsin, although we're talking uh, internally about making those more useful here. Um, last point that I'll offer on these permits is that all of them have, again, that non-reporting component to them. They also have formal reporting components which require an application to and a verification of coverage from our agency. And again, those non-reporting, hitting home, those are not the same as exempt. They actually fall within a regional general permit and there are conditions tied to that, um, that approval. Once you move out of our regional general permits and our nationwide permit program, you fall into um, what we call an individual permit review. We have a letter of permission, which is more of an intermediate. It's um, a more moderate review at a higher level. Um, but these are intended for projects that do not fit our general permit, either because there's no category that fits them, which I try to remedy because the regional general permits are generally intended for projects that are individually and cumulatively minor across the state. So in theory, 
these types of authorizations are for projects that may not meet that threshold, so our evaluation becomes a little bit more rigorous. Um, another point to be, too, is that as the acreage of impact associated with a given project increases, in some cases I recognize their restoration projects. We do try to have specific categories where, which lower the review barrier for those simply because we know and recognize that they're beneficial. But historically, there have been projects, unfortunately, that we've had to use this higher level of review for simply because we historically had no permit vehicle that would allow us to evaluate a project with five acres of impact or greater to a water of the U.S. So with that, I don't know if there's any questions or if anyone has any thoughts about the categories of regional general permits or higher level permit reviews that we complete in Wisconsin. Um, and then we'll get into the really exciting part of the presentation where I talk about how we evaluate a project. Okay. Um, what I'll say here is that any 404 decision that we issue requires that we comply with all three of these. They're formally part of our review nationwide. For Section 10, we can kind of cut out that um, 404B1 guidelines analysis at the bottom there. Um, but we can, depending on the project, truncate that. Um, I do have another new acronym in here, which I did call out. I'll use it a few times through here, National Environmental Policy Act. Uh, another thing, the state does have a similar process under WEPA. And actually those two, from what I've seen, those two um, requirements seem to overlap pretty well. So two slides on NEPA a little bit. While you won't see it in a lot of the projects you work on, it's worth mentioning. Uh, again, this is a slide I'm not going to read out, but what it does is this act forces all federal agencies with an action, whether it be funding or a permit, to describe the anticipated consequences of a proposed action prior to making a decision on their particular action, again, whether that be funding or whether that be permitting. So, oh, I thought I heard something in there. Um, so, for instance, um, some NRCS projects, and I haven't really sat down with them, but um, I think they need to go through this for a lot of the things that they're proposing as well. Now, they can do a lot of this on a programmatic basis, and when we issue a regional general permit, we go through this NEPA analysis at the time we're proposing to issue those regional general permits. So it obviates the need for us to go through and complete NEPA individually for each action that we would authorize under a regional general permit. Um, and there are regulations. I put in our implementing regulations, but there are um, CEQ, Council of Environmental Quality, regulations that are required for all federal agencies, and those are at 40 Code of Federal Regulations, Part 1500 to 1508. Um, yeah, maybe I will wait to talk about a little bit more. I've got one last fantastic NEPA slide for you here. Uh, there you go. Um, when I say lower level on this slide, we're talking about projects that, again, individually and cumulatively would not have a significant impact on the environment. So whenever we issue any of those lovely regional general permits, GP2, GP3, and GP4, we're completing this NEPA analysis. Um, they have been EAs. If we get to the point of our EA where we find there may be a significant impact, then we likely will not be issuing that regional general permit um, because those activities are intended to be minor, and if an EIS is required to evaluate them, then we need to go back to the drawing board and come up with something that's a little less open. <laughs> 
So all our regional general permits end up with an EA and a FONSI at the end. Um, and some of our higher level projects, very rarely do we have an EIS that the Corps of Engineers will lead from their regulatory program. We've got one right now within the two states, and that's for a very large mine you may have heard of called Polymet in Minnesota. Um, in Wisconsin, the last EIS that we led drafting was for the Oak Creek Power Plant. Um, and if it had been pursued as a project, the GTAC mine in northern Wisconsin would have required an EIS from our agency as well. Um, for those who may have worked with federal highways, um, a lot of their projects, because they're giving funding for WISDOT, require these larger evaluations, often EISs that I see. And we cooperate with them on those so that we can adopt them for our purposes at the end. Um, I guess a couple more just to throw in some fun facts about NEPA. One of my other main jobs as a program manager is reviewing the EISs that are produced statewide. Again, a lot of those are federal highways. And the process for those reviews, not from my end, but just from a drafting perspective to get from the beginning to the end, is a few years. Um, sometimes a few years stretches to 10 or more. I think we're at 10 years with Polymet. And I think when we did have the Crand in mind, which is another EIS that was led by the Corps, that was never concluded after 10 years, I think, um, because the project was withdrawn. And I will, I see there are no questions in the chat. I'll move into the next of the three legs of our stool review again. The first one was compliance with NEPA. The second one is really our public interest review. If you recall an earlier slide, we're not allowed to authorize a project that would not be within the public interest. Um, so if you look at this, these, this is a list of factors that we must consider. It is the minimum we must consider. Um, and when we do draft our regional general permits, we discuss how the proposed activities which could be authorized under them meet or address public interest. Um, and again, so that streamlines our review when we do get to our general permits. These scale in, in importance relative to where a project is. For example, if because these are applied na nationally, if you looked at a project along the Colorado River, some of the more important public interest factors you would consider would probably be property rights and, of course, water supply and conservation. But if you looked at the Nemanji recreation and water quality, might be some of the prime considerations that you would look at here as well. Um, fish and wildlife values would factor in. Um, another thing that scales the importance of the factor, and this is again going back to that best professional judgment way earlier in this presentation that I talked about, because these are very subjective things to determine. Um, the importance of a factor is relative to where it is, but not, but also relative to the scale of the project. Um, so, for example, if you're in the Milwaukee area, um, an MMSD flood project might likely involve a stronger consideration of flood hazards um, or water quality. And then we also scale the weight to each of these factors dependent upon how closely that factor is tied to our program. So. I think the big, biggest challenge with this is ascribing weight appropriately to each factor, particularly when we've got competing um, interest factors. I think this is rehashing some of what I have already indicated to you here. Again, the determination includes balancing and best professional judgment. Um, and. Um, you know, one of the considerations that's kind of been a hot button within our, our agency has been consideration of a tipping point. Um, most people who go to school for environmental um, degrees see this sort of a conversation that's been in academia for quite some time now. So it's challenging to determine. Um, some of the discussions for our program are because you, you see 
a lot of individually small actions contribute to a larger effect, is there a point in time where the core is going to have to start to consider um, prohibiting activities because in aggregate they've started to have a larger effect? Or should we be looking at uh, more stringent controls on larger projects that would have a larger effect individually while still allowing individual projects that are cumulatively small? becomes a lot of fun. And I say that with full sarcasm. Um, generally, for most of the projects that we see from um, the audience I've got here, it's not a big issue. But again, there are a lot of considerations, and that's the most, the biggest point I want to make here. Um, and the magnitude of the project being proposed, if not beneficial to the environment, um, certainly plays into that. So with that's all I had on the public interest review. Moving further to the third leg of our stool, I have a little bit on our 404B1 compliance. You might hear a lot of our staff throw out the 404B1 guidelines a lot. And this is the heart of what they're talking about. There's four tests um, within the 404B1 guidelines. And again, this is not applicable to anything that only requires authorization under Section 10. Uh, again, our federally navigable waters. Um, and, and this is probably the test you hear or could hear our staff talk about the most. We t talk about the LEDPA here, yet another acronym, the least environmentally damaging practical alternative. So. What that requires is for us to evaluate other options that can accomplish the project purpose, generally speaking. Um, we often looked at three alternatives when we're looking at that, and those are comprised of a no action alternative. So if nothing's done, um, how does that meet the purpose? And usually it doesn't meet the purpose. But as a baseline for comparison to other alternatives, we usually consider it in our evaluation. Then the second alternative we typically will look at is the project proponents proposed project, and then we need to um, consider any other alternatives they've made, they may have brought forward that they think could have accomplished their purpose but was dismissed for a variety of reasons, perhaps cost, logistics, technology, increased impacts to aquatic resources, what have you. Um, interestingly enough, the state program for most of their activities um, requires a formal um, practical alternatives analysis, and that's really helpful for our agency because it's something that's not formally called out as the requirement for an application to us. But if not provided and we need to complete this alternatives analysis, we're going to have to think up what that other alternative could be that might meet the project purpose. So these are the times where you might see our project managers coming back to you and saying, well, instead of rock, could you do some biostabilization? Usually it's because that sort of information is not submitted with the permit application and we need to be able to document it was considered and it wasn't appropriate. So um, what this test also does is it directs us to make sure that the, that the activity we might authorize is the least environmentally damaging and that requires some documentation of avoidance, minimization, and mitigation. For most projects, um, this test also requires that we assume that the purpose can be accomplished without impacting an aquatic resource. So um, depending on the type of project we're reviewing, that can be challenging. There are some things that are exempt from that requirement because they're water dependent, but um, that tends to be a minority of the, proje of the projects we see. Um, trying to think if I have anything more I wanted to indicate to you on that. I think that's probably good. Thanks for sticking with me, everybody. I know that regulations aren't very exciting, so I appreciate your time. And um, hopefully, I'm, I'm hoping you're getting some value out of this. So while I talk, I put this little picture here. This is from a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away when I used to work in Minnesota the Blanding's turtle there was listed. So I've got this lovely picture of this guy here. Um, but the text is about our second test. And 
some of you, I know this has come up particularly in the La Crosse and Driftless area that some of our project management staff have been coming back and asking for things like whether or not the northern long-eared bat has been adequately um, coordinated with the Fish and Wildlife Service for a variety of projects. And here's the crux of where that requirement comes from for our program. Because we need to, if we're the lead federal agency, make sure that, that um, federally threatened and endangered species under the ESA are appropriately treated, or the lead federal agency has done that. So the lead federal agency is usually the one with the biggest hook over the project, and when our hook is usually just a permit. Someone like NRCS might be funding the whole project, so in those situations, the hook usually lies with them. Um, so that's often why we'll ask if that has been completed for a project for that was originally funded through NRCS because we're looking for compliance under this test. In shorthand, I like to consider this to be the have you complied with other laws test because in addition to the ESA there, it also talks about state water quality standards. And particularly for our higher level projects, we're prohibited from issuing our decision until we know that this has been met. So we'll wait for the state permit to come in first. Okay, moving into our third test. Whoa. Our third test here, I don't think this is often a problem with a lot of the projects we see from everyone here, but again, this gets to the, the line needs to be drawn somewhere kind of consideration. So it's duplicated here in our program. And again, this is something that's, that often requires evaluation with best professional judgment to determine how significantly the project will degrade waters of the U.S. Um, for this one, though, we're pretty clearly looking at the specific discharge and not the aggregate of similar actions within a finite area, whether it be a watershed or a state. Um, yet another fun fact for everyone here, this is the only one of the four tests that is specific to waters of the U.S. The rest of them are all relative to aquatic resources, so uh, broad, more broadly considered beyond just those waters we have regulatory authority over. And then our final test here. This one is very similar to the first test where we talked about the least environmentally damaging practical alternative, but this gets more at um, human uses for the aquatic ecosystem, and this is a very long test within our regulations, and there are a lot of subparts that talk about it. So the, this gets at appropriately sized equipment, operator training, invasive species, avoiding high quality areas, human uses like aesthetics and recreation, and other things like managing runoff. Um, and appropriate and practical steps here again would be considering the discharge location. Again, that gets at minimization of impacts to waters of the U.S. The material to be discharged, of course, we don't want anything discharged that would have pollutants in it, and the control and dispersion of any materials um, which may be discharged. For example, when dams are removed, we often need to look at the amount of sediment behind it to see how that sluices downstream and what sort of effect that might have. Um, and that's, that's it for our evaluation. So we've kind of gone through a little bit of the avoidance and the minimization and the three tests. So the last component would be compensatory mitigation. I think I just gave you one little slide on those because I don't think that that really impacts a lot of your programs unless you're talking about actually complete, completing a restoration yourself and looking at having those credits be available as a mitigation bank or something like that. Um, in Wisconsin, we tend not to require compensation for things that qualify for our general permits unless that compensation is re required to ensure that the project is individually and cumulatively minor in significance. Um, 
typically we require mitigation for impacts that exceed 10,000 square feet where the impacts are not beneficial. So again, thinking back to some of these larger restorations, if there's a five acre impact and it's proposed as part of a wetland restoration, certainly we wouldn't want to ding that sort of an applicant and require that they provide additional compensation because the fundamental project purpose is to be beneficial to the environment. Um, I guess one last thing besides what's written on the slide is just highlighting that mitigation is very expensive. And while that's not, that's not intended to be um, something that dissuades people from larger impacts because, well, first of all, we don't have any control over the pricing structure that the public requires for their compensation. Um, but it, it does tend to work as a dissuading factor. Um, the last, the last I heard is that um, per credit in Wisconsin, they charge between forty and sixty thousand um, dollars. And just to kind of put that in reference, um, a credit is often equal to offsetting under an acre. Um, depending on the type of project, we factor into consideration things like how close that mitigation is to the losses and the function of the mitigation compared to the losses that we would authorize. So often there's a higher mitigation component and that's why we call it a credit. So it's not usually a one-to-one. -one. Um, most frequently we see 1.45. I know that's a weird number for rounding, but 1.45 credits required for every acre lost. So if you're multiplying that by an average of $50,000 per credit, um, it's, it's pretty expensive. Uh, one of the last things I think I'll say about mitigation is that because our 404 program is predicated on waters of the US, I think a lot of people lose this in, in translation. but. Um, we do require mitigation at times for riverine and lacustrine impacts as well. Um, one project that I had when I was uh, working actively permitting projects for our agency would have encapsulated, um, I want to say it was maybe five acres of Lake Michigan. And that area was proposed to receive cooling water from a power plant. Um, and we did require mitigation for that because, of course, it was near shore habitat that was used for fish. And that's often very challenging to provide. So in that case, we really looked at them contributing to fish stocking programs um, for other projects. We've looked at them obtaining other parcels and restoring um, shoreline habitat for migratory birds. So it's really an opportunity and gets us thinking outside of the box a little bit. And with that, I actually, whoa, am done. So um, I do have a couple links up here. Unfortunately, the one for our web page is very general because we do change where a lot of our links are. So I'd like to just point you to our main page, and you can look within that. Um, on the right-hand toolbar, that's where we generally keep a list of our staff by state. Unfortunately, they don't list the names with it because of um, personal identifiable information that they don't allow us to link that online. But it does have um, emails and phone information for the offices. I think many of you probably already know who your core project manager is, but that information is there um, if you need it. Otherwise, I have my contact information listed here as well. You're welcome to send me an email or give me a call whenever you'd like. Um, I put a little asterisk on that because a lot of times I get phone calls, it's really about a specific project and it's couched as though it's a program or a policy question. And um, often, again, just like these exemptions, sometimes there's some details to the story that I might not get just talking to one person on the phone. So often I need to make sure that I know the full suite of information relative to something that's project specific before I can answer it. And that ends up with me turning to our program or our um, project management staff. So with that, um, 
I know the biggest burning question from everyone's mind is whether Anthony the Escape Artist is still out there practicing. Um, I will tell you he is still alive and he is a practicing magician. He's somewhat older now so he's an adult and responsible for his own self. Um, but bigger than that I really do hope that you were able to get some interest out of our regulations and take home some thoughts about how we can do things better and how we can work together. I hope I can see some of you in our follow-up sessions that Christina is putting together for everyone. Um, I think those will be a good time to get get hands into some of these issues and really be able to talk about them face to face and and ultimately I can always take back a lot of that interaction to try to make sure our programs are improved for the benefit of everyone so um, thanks for your time and we can open up to questions um, and I will turn it over to Christina all right, thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, so yeah, if anybody has any questions, again, feel free to unmute yourself, which is at the the very top of your GoToMeeting bar, the little microphone, um, or type your questions into the chat, and Rebecca can see those as well, so she can answer them as they come through. So does anybody have any questions before we let Rebecca go? Hi guys, this is Cami. Um, I have a couple follow-ups for uh, Rebecca because I, I get these questions a lot and I wonder if she could talk about um, first of all when it comes to stream and lake mitigation um, other than the one example that she gave you know with respect to some of these stream projects that a lot of the people on the call um, do you know when typically you might require that because that's something that the DNR doesn't require but the federal government does and then my second question is related to the exemptions and um, um, maybe she could talk a little bit about um, tiling because um, I get an awful lot of questions about tiling and is it exempt and when is it exempt and um, I don't know if we want to tackle the issue of prior converted land and that sort of thing today, but tiling for sure, I'd like to hear a few thoughts, so thanks. Okay. No, those are all good questions. I want to make sure that I'm getting at what you want to talk about here, and I'm going to start at the end because PC is, the, is one of the ones, I don't want to say the easiest, but um, maybe of interest to the listeners on the phone, the clean water rule that was stayed actually had no change at all. Um, the language was verbatim regarding how we determine jurisdiction over aquatic resources that may be present on prior converted wetland. And with that statement, let me just call out something here that I think is often lost, inherent in that. Um, just because a piece of property has been designated PC does not mean that there are not wetlands. Um, what that PC designation is getting at is not really whether there's wetlands on site or not, but how the Corps generally ascribes jurisdiction to any wetlands that might be present on that property. So just to be specific on that, um, if you do have a parcel of land that was certified as PC by the NRCS, the regulations say that we generally will not have regulatory authority over aquatic resources present on that property. And with that, there have been times where we have asserted jurisdiction over those resources. When we do, we need to turn to EPA and get their buy-in on it. Um, as a project manager, I have had cases where that was um, the situation. Um, and that would continue whether we have the existing regulations in place or whether we go back to that clean water rule that's currently being litigated, at least as it's, as it's drafted now. Um, both of them treat PC that same way. With that said, um, I'll throw a bone to Cami on this because they don't have that sort of binding language that I'm aware of in state regulation. Um, so if there are wetlands present on a property that's labeled as PC, they still may be subject to state regulatory authority. So just a cautionary note out there for people on that. Um, going back in my notes from what you asked about, Cami, you had also asked about tiling. 
um, and exemptions for that. I assume, and let me see if I can go back to the appropriate slide here. Um, you're probably talking about um, maintenance. I don't know if you want to just unmute yourself and confirm that for me or not. Yeah, you have the one um, exemption for, yeah, the second one there, maintenance, emerging, yeah, that one. Yeah. Well, that one is challenging, um, and again, I can't give you a cookbook for that because there just isn't one. There's always so much case specificity to these determinations. Um, and again, it often hinges on this recently here. Um, and, and I hate to call you out again, Cami, but I know you don't have that word in your exemption. But for us, there can be situations where um, a landowner would like to maintain drain tile and it could be in a wetland and the reason it might be exhibiting those wetland characters is because it's failing. Um, if someone were interested in trying to use this exemption, they certainly would want to pursue, um, and again, as I indicated earlier, getting confirmation that they meet the exemption because if someone goes ahead with work and they're wrong, it doesn't obviate them from enforcement under the Clean Water Act. So I would always recommend they get that confirmation. But again, we would be looking at maintaining it, not improving it. So for example, if someone had clay tile in and they had, I know we don't have the same tools. Um, we didn't have the same tools historically as we do now. But we would be looking for um, roughly a similar reduction in surface water or within that croppable layer as was originally anticipated. It couldn't be an improvement. Um, it may be kicked out depending on the character of the material being used because, again, these, these are often construed very narrowly. So, for example, if someone was moving from clay tile to PVC, that might also, unfortunately, kick someone out. Um, that's going to be a case-specific determination. But we do have a maintenance, non-reporting, regional general permit. And that's a little bit more expansive. So it picks up where this exemption may be very narrow. And there's an increased likelihood that someone proposing that sort of work might fit for that category. Um, but certainly, this couldn't be used to install new, new tile. Um, and then again, let me see if I can move through my slides here a little bit on the exemptions. We still do have these kickouts. Now this one here, well, just to help everyone see a little bit better, this usually isn't the problem that we look at when we're evaluating replacement of drain tile within an aquatic resource. Usually the problem is related to the recapture provision here. So, and this kind of gets into that conversation that we have about whether or not it's recently damaged. Because if it's really been a swamp for 10 years, that's a pretty bright line we can look at and say, that's not fitting recently. And if you were to propose that, pro that, that project, you're converting a water of the US. Um, and certainly, you're reducing the flow and circulation and the reach. Um, so in that sort of situation, it would be pretty easy for us to say it doesn't meet an exemption, even if they were to opt to use something crazy like um, tile, drain tile or clay drain tile. Um, now, again, it's, it's very case specific. And another thing is, well, if it's been one year, um, I think we could, in most circumstances, pretty readily say that that fits recently. But you do start to get into a gray area. So that's part of why we have a lot of these determinations move up to a higher level reviewer. Um, and oftentimes, even with it coming to the higher level reviewer, if it seems questionable, it ends up going all the way to our chief. Um, does that get at what you were wanting me to bring up about tiling? Yep, that covers it. OK. Oh, I will say also, um, again, going back to this oh, slide 17 here. This is something we're always going to look at before we consider the exemption, right? Is the subject land jurisdictional? And again, getting at your PC question may or may not be under 404. 
And then is there a regulated activity? Because that's often been a historical, I should add that on for drain tile too. There used to be this premise that if someone was knifing in drain tile within a wetland, that there was no regulated activity, whether it was a, a water of the US or not. Um, with some of the science out there, I, I would not recommend anybody hang their hat on that. Um, because I think we've seen cases where that might not be true. Certainly, you could say that that's relative to the diameter of the tile proposed for installation. But just on the safe side, I know we have had enforcement cases um, that have been accepted at a higher level where, where it was drain tile installation um, that incorporated a discharge. So I should mention that as well. Um, mitigation. Again, I, I'm not sure if I understood your question about mitigation for riverine and lacustrine impacts. Um, are you talking about where we might have a tipping point? I know for wetlands I mentioned 10,000 square feet. Um, it really depends at the, on the activity. And I gave some pretty easy examples if you're enclosing so many acres of a lake and it's just gone. For habitat, that's pretty easy for us to tie and say that there are some functional losses that require mitigation. But beyond that, it gets far more challenging. Um, dams are often controversial, and we look at mitigation potentially for either the installation or the removal of those because, as a lot of you might know, some of these dams, when they're removed, there's a lovely impoundment upstream that a lot of people have put their homes on, and they really don't want to see that go away. And it's not necessarily that we're requiring the mitigation because they're losing their shoreline habitat, but there are a suite of functions that that impoundment um, has that would certainly be lost that we would be looking at compensating for. Um, I'm not aware that we've had a stream bank armoring project where we've required compensatory mitigation. But I think certainly if someone was looking at channelizing a stream, that would be a very real option for us to try to consider, depending on the functions of the waterway that they're looking at removing that sinuosity from. So if you had any more, I don't know if, you, if, if that gets at your question, um, you're certainly welcome to let me know. No, that, that covers it. I think, you know, one example, what, what you just mentioned is potentially if, you know, some of the bends of a stream were going to be removed for some reason and stream length was taken out, that that might be a case where you, you guys might require mitigation. But that typically it sounds like with the stream bank erosion control projects that a lot of the county and NRCS staff get involved with that you typically don't require it. Yeah, and that, you know, a lot of those, I know people don't like that we get into the regulatory arena on a lot of those, but, um, and, I, and I think generally um, we get through it favorably, but um, a lot of what, we look at is the loss of the natural habitat and again having to look at that tipping point kind of issue. Um, I know we do have a lot of angst trying to consider that. Um, of course there's other issues too so one of, the, one of the main reasons I think that we hang our hat on when we are not requiring mitigation for those is that there may be um, certainly some some negative impacts for sediment de deposition downstream that would be eliminated with some of that stabilization. Um, so I think that's one thing that we look at as well too. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? Again, expecting some. Yeah, again, feel free to unmute yourself or add it into the chat. There are a few people that are unmuted. I'm not sure if they are, would like to ask a question. Okay. 
Well, Rebecca, I, I suppose you mentioned that um, they could also email you if they have any additional questions. Oh, here we go. You have one from Dane County. How long does it take to get a review response? Absolutely. Uh -huh. That's a fantastic question. Thanks for throwing that in there. Um, unfortunately, and here's another difference from state, we have no time frames prescribed that we need to meet. Um, I know nationally some of our districts that use the nationwide programs have what I like to call that Cinderella clause to them where if a review and a decision isn't transmitted within, I think it's 45 days, the project is considered authorized. While we've got metrics where we're funded and um, given staff dependent upon our timeliness, it's not a requirement. Um, I think after the sequester hit us, we really dropped our numbers. We used to be pretty good nationwide. We were one of the best, um, but that's no longer the case. So with all that dodging, I think the real answer is that typically things that require um, confirmation from our agency are provided around 60 days. I think the last metrics I saw are that we're issuing 80% of them within that time frame. I don't know how it drops for 30%. I assume it's probably not great. I think most of them are coming between 30 and 60 days. Um, so I think that's that more gets at most of the projects this audience has. Um, Again, if somebody's looking for an approved jurisdictional determination with that, that's going to extend it. I think earlier I indicated that that's usually two months right there. So we wouldn't be processing any decision until after that was complete. So um, that can certainly extend that time frame, generally not by a full two months, but maybe up to 90 days. Um, yet another reason why people tend to prefer those preliminary JDs. Um, for our higher level reviews, I think our, our targets are within 120 days. And I know we did not meet the metric this last fiscal year for that. I want to say we just missed it. And um, on average, I think we were around 134 days for those, at least for the majority. And when I say majority, I want to say that was 80% of those decisions. Now, certainly, you're welcome to, to call up your project manager and ask them where they're at. Um, you're certainly welcome to also tell them if you've got a handful of projects out there and some should be prioritized where some could maybe, um, which ones would be your priority. Certainly, that's useful information. I can't guarantee we can address that. Um, another issue is that, and uh, Dane County, right? Um, Currently, you're probably aware of this, we don't have a project manager covering Dane County right now. We lost Simone Cole. Um, I think her last day working was in July. So that's an area where you you might be seeing some fits and spurts in reviews as we try to pick up the workload and disperse it among the existing staff that we have. Another question from Dane here, and for those of you who might not be looking at the chat, it reads, you mentioned that a determination is good for up to five years. Who decides if a determination needs to be redone within that five-year period? Again, a good question, um, and typically we don't look at them again unless some prompt is given to us. We've got enough work where we aren't going around and revisiting all our, our um, wetland wetland delineation concurrences each year. So um, usually it'll be someone comes to us and they say, oh, we had this delineation done four years ago and we want to do this project. We'd like to rely upon these boundaries for our new project. In those sorts of situations, we'll take a look at it and say, mm, OK, it looks like the landscape is generally similar to what it was four years ago when we defined those boundaries. Um, go ahead and do that. But if there's a lot of changes to the landscape, that's when we make that evaluation. OK, you might want to go out and look at those again. And in the majority of those cases, we don't require a full-blown delineation. It might just be more of a verification that those boundaries are the same. If the field review shows that those boundaries are not generally the same, then you might get into a little bit more of having to complete those data points. So generally, not at all. We won't look at them at all unless something prompts us to.
Great. Any other questions? Okay. All right, we'll say last call for questions, and we will let Rebecca go. Okay, you must have been extremely thorough. <laughs> thank you, Rebecca, very much. And thank you, everybody who joined us. Um, again, we'll be doing the workshops this um, winter, so please stay tuned for that. And I will have the recording of this webinar um, posted um, relatively shortly, and, and I'll send that message out to the, the whole listserv so everybody has a chance to review it if they need to. Um, in the meantime, if you have any additional questions, we've got this slide up right now Rebecca has with, um, additional information on how to reach these people. And if you have any other questions about the workshop, feel free to contact me at Christina at WisconsinLandWater.org. Uh, thanks again, Rebecca, for um, participating, and um, we will talk to you soon.